The boys, as they talked to the girls from Marcia Blaine's school, stood on the far side of their bicycles, holding the handlebars, which established a protective fence of bicycle between the sexes and the impression that, at any moment, the boys were likely to be away. The girls could not take off their Panama hats because this was not far from the school gates and hatlessness was an offence. These girls formed the Brody set. They were discovered to have heard of Mussolini, the Italian Renaissance painters, the word Minage. The interior decoration of the London house of the author of Winnie the Pooh had been described to them as had the love lives of Charlotte Bronte and of Miss Brody herself. They were aware of the existence of Einstein and the arguments of those who considered the Bible to be untrue. They knew the rudiments of astrology, but not the date of the Battle of Flodden or the capital of Finland. All of the Brody set, save one, counted on its fingers, as had Miss Brody, with accurate results, more or less. Now at sixteen, Monica Douglas was a prefect famous mostly for mathematics, which she could do in her brain, and for her anger, which, when it was lively enough, drove her to slap out to right and left. Since she had turned sixteen, Monica wore her Panama hat rather higher on her head than normal, perched as if it were too small, and as if she knew she looked grotesque in any case. Rose Stanley was famous for sex. Her hat was placed quite unobtrusively on her blonde short hair, but she dented in the crown on either side. Eunice Gardner, small, neat, and famous for her sprightly gymnastics and glamorous swimming, had the brim of her hat turned up at the front and down at the back. Sandy Stranger wore it turned up all round and as far back on her head as it could possibly go. She was merely notorious for her small, almost non-existent eyes, but she was famous for her vowel sounds, which, long ago, in the long past in the junior school, had enraptured Miss Brodie. Along came Mary MacGregor, the last member of the set, whose fame rested on her being a silent lump, a nobody whom everybody could blame. Six years previously, Miss Brodie had led her new class into the garden for a history lesson underneath a big elm. If anyone comes along, said Miss Brodie, in the course of the following lesson, remember that it is the R for English grammar. Meanwhile, I will tell you a little of my life when I was younger than I am now, though six years older than the man himself. She leaned against the elm. It was one of the last autumn days when the leaves were falling in little gusts. They fell on the children who were thankful for this excuse to wriggle and for the allowable movements in brushing the leaves from their hair and laps. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness. I was engaged to a young man at the beginning of the war, but he fell on Flanders Field. He fell like an autumn leaf, although he was only twenty-two of age. He was poor. He came from Ayrshire, a countryman, but a hard-working and clever scholar. He said, when he asked me to marry him, we shall have to drink water and walk slow. That was Hugh's country way of expressing that we would live quietly. We shall drink water and walk slow. What does the saying signify, Rose? That you would live quietly, Miss Brodie said Rose Stanley, who, six years later, had a great reputation for sex. The story of Miss Brodie's felt fiancé was well on its way when the headmistress, Miss Mackay, was seen to approach across the lawn. Tears had already started to drop from Sandy's little pig-like eyes, and Sandy's tears now affected her friend Jenny, later famous in the school for her beauty, who gave a sob and groped up the leg of her knickers for her handkerchief. Hugh was killed, said Miss Brodie, a week before a mistress. After that there was a general election and the people were saying, Hang the Kaiser. Hugh was one of the flowers of the forest, lying in his grave. Rose Stanley had now begun to weep. Sandy slid her wet eyes sideways, watching the advance of Miss Mackay, head and shoulders forward, across the lawn. I am come to see you, and I have to be off, she said. 
What are you little girls crying for? They are moved by a story I've been telling them. We are having a history lesson," said Miss Brody, catching a falling leaf neatly in her hand as she spoke. "Crying over a story at ten years of age," said Miss Mackay to the girls, who had strugglingly risen from the benches, still dazed with Hugh the warrior. "I am only come to see you, and I must be off. Well, girls, the new term has begun." I hope you all had a splendid summer holiday, and I look forward to seeing your splendid essays on how you spent them. You shouldn't be crying over history at the age of ten. My word! You did well," said Miss Brodie to the class when Miss Mackay had gone, "not to answer the question put to you. It is well when in difficulties to say never a word, neither black nor white." Speech is silver, but silence is golden. Mary, are you listening? What was I saying? Mary MacGregor, lumpy, with merely two eyes, a nose, and a mouth like a snowman, who was later famous for being stupid and always to blame, and who, at the age of twenty-three, lost her life in a hotel fire, ventured. Golden. What did I say was golden? Mary cast her eyes around her and up above. Sandy whispered, "The falling leaves." The falling leaves," said Mary. Plainly," said Miss Brodie, "you were not listening to me. If only you small girls would listen to me, I would make of you the creme, de la creme."